Welcome everyone. My name is Blaine Brownell. I'm the director of the School of Architecture and thrilled to have our uh, guest today. Uh, before I introduce Mijin, I will uh, introduce the panel uh, in the space with me. Uh, in the space with me uh, today, uh, in addition to our uh, speaker, uh, our Greer Friedrich, who's executive assistant in the school, and Betsy West, uh, who's uh, faculty of the School of Architecture, and both of them have done a tremendous amount to coordinate and put this lecture series together. And we have a number of students here uh, <clears throat> invited by Professor Lydia Klein, who had a conflict today, uh, but the students have been studying uh, Mijin's work and Halloran Yoon's work, uh, and all have formulated some questions for our speaker today. So we'll follow uh, the lecture <clears throat> with a student panel discussion. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker. Mijin Yoon is the Dean of Cornell University's College of Architecture, Art and Planning and co-founder of Howler and Yoon, an award-winning design studio engaged in projects across the globe. One of the most celebrated and respected contemporary architects, educators and material innovators, Yoon is committed to advancing pedagogy, research and practice to expand new knowledge and imaginaries and to bring deep expertise to the urgent environmental and social challenges facing our cities and communities. Yoon's design research examines intersections between architecture, urbanism, technology, and the public realm. Haller and Yoon's work has been widely recognized with features and publications such as the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Boston Globe and honored with awards from the American Institute of Architects, the American Academy in Rome, the Graham Foundation, and many others. Just this month, Yoon was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the highest form of recognition of artistic merit in the United States. It's an incredible pleasure to introduce Mi Jin Yoon. Thanks so much. And, um... Thank you to my panelists here. Looking forward to our conversation and to all that are participating. I will try to share my screen. Okay, great. Well, I am operating under the assumption that you can see my screen, but if not, holler. <laughs> great. I'm going to minimize it so I don't look at myself. Great, so um, thank you so much, Blaine, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, I wanted to use today to take stock, I guess, of our contemporary moment. Uh, and so I think it's important that we ask, uh, what's the matter? And uh, I think for me, the question's both literal and speculative. I'm referring to the term matter um, both in terms of physical substance, but really much more in terms of the essence of things um, and specifically the essence of our problems. Um, so the problems of the moment we know are numerous and intersectional and, um, you know, from the pandemic, which has changed every aspect of our life um, in terms of public health and how we interact with one another falling into questions of publicness and collectiveness, uh, to racialized violence against the Black community, which in the US begins with colonization and the institution of slavery, and continues today through systemic racism, structural racism, and also the recent um, increased racialized violence against the Asian community uh, with the Atlanta uh, shooting. So, I think our multicultural democracy is uh, currently being tested. Um, and we're seeing on one hand, uh, incredible movements of consciousness, uh, unlearning, relearning, solidarity, uh, existing alongside incredibly divisive politics. And all of this against a uh, um, climate emergency, um, and a demand for climate action. So I think in taking stock of the present, we, um, when we ask what's the matter in order to articulate what matters, 
um, for, for me, it brings, you know, questions about the values and beliefs and aspirations uh, of all of us as a discipline. And as architects, how we materialize what we value and um, how what we build conveys our values and essentially how we build what matters. Um, at the same time, we recognize that technologies have brought us closer together. They've also like pulled us further apart. Um, and we recognize that uh, with devices, every interaction is always already mediated, uh, even in public. Uh, we use our devices to record events rather than experience them um, and watch them ourselves. Uh, we've noticed behaviors and behavioral patterns that suggest that people are more engaged with their devices than the kind of uh, incredible world um, around them. Uh, and it's been said that we're living in the kind of age of information, that our present moment is characterized by a simultaneously like abundance or superabundance of information and digital collectivity, um, and simultaneously a lack of uh, certainty. So our age of information is uh, and big data is coinciding with an age of post-truth and the erosion of trust. Um, in things that uh, we, we had trust in before. Um, so we all are very much aware that we're living through a kind of transformational moment in uh, human history. Uh, and uh, COVID-19 is the first pandemic of the jet age where our physical interconnectedness via planes and trains and subways circulated the virus rapidly. Um, but it's also the first pandemic of the fourth industrial revolution where data science, genomics, rapid prototyping, distributed manufacturing, machine learning have all led to the kind of amazing technological innovations that have led to the unprecedented uh, innovations in vaccine development, manufacturing, and now finally distribution. So, um, the term fourth industrial uh, revolution is coined by Klaus Schwab, and uh, he's referring to technologies such as robotics, additive manufacturing, uh, artificial intelligence, that are on one hand enabling us to solve incredibly complex problems, but they're also rapidly changing the way we create, exchange, and distribute value. And um, this intersection, um, you know, challenges us in this moment of this interconnected uh, world. And I think we're all very much aware that cities um, and the built environment is at an inflection point. Um, cities are both the engines of productivity and economic growth. 80% of GNP is generated in cities, but they're also the source of 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions and facing layered uh, urban risks. Um, from climate change to um, economic challenges to affordable housing shortages, declining infrastructure. Um, and so these challenges are complex, multifaceted, and interconnected. So one of my favorite quotes about design comes from Charles and Ray Eames. When uh, Charles was asked, uh, what are the limits of design? He responded with a question, what are the limits of problems? And I think design is actually defined by the series of problems that need design attention. Um, our own practice began 15 years ago, working on projects that uh, looked at integrating technology into architecture. And at that time, we argued that media was a form of material, and that was uh, evident in our 2004 uh, White Noise, White Light project for the Athens Olympics. Um, but I think looking at our projects today, we're more engaged in uh, thinking through like both the means of the architect, the tools, the digital tools of the architect um, to act on maybe more conventional materials. Uh, so today we are um, asking instead of um, wondering about media as material, we're asking, you know, really what is material after media in this age of kind of technological transformation 
in and, and at the intersection of all of these global challenges. The first project I wanted to share takes us to April 15th, 2013, uh, in the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombings. And um, uh, during the um, period following the bombings, the Tsarnaev brothers um, uh, were um, uh, trying to escape and uh, came through MIT's campus where I was a faculty member at the time and shot a, a young uh, campus police officer, Sean Collier. And there was a kind of incredible outpouring of kind of grief, um, but also fear, I would say at the same time, it really shook not only the city, but uh, the campus. And um, the provost convened um, a group, a committee to talk about how to honor Sean Collier. And that committee determined that there should be a form of memorial and concluded a physical memorial to honor Sean's service um, and uh, sacrifice. So, um, the committee, you know, talked about the things that Sean really loved, and there was conversations about his love of the outdoors and the cairn, uh, the stacking of rocks. Um, but they also um, uh, solicited the community for ideas um, that um, that could represent what Sean stood for, and it was a tense time between. Um, uh, members of the community strongly feeling that um, the American flag needed to be part of the memorial, um, a kind of sense of heroism that was also tied to a sense of nationalism. And what um, kind of emerged at the time in terms of the uh, terminology was this notion of strength. So MIT strong, and 179 was Sean's badge number. And I was asked if I could synthesize all of this community input and develop a memorial to honor uh, Sean. And I remember at the time, and given my, my background, um, uh, reflecting on some of these powerful what I would say are strong memorials that um, happened in our kind of urban context at the time. And so the signage on buses and the signage um, on our kind of highway underpasses, you know, recognize this moment, the fallen heroes and the injured in the marathon bombing. But what became clear working with the committee is that they really wanted something physical to uh, represent Sean and there was no escaping the, um, the media part of the memorial in terms of the message, uh, the metaphors. And so uh, the concept really comes from being able to uh, move between metaphors. So at MIT, the uh, motto is hand and mind and thinking about strength and uh, the community coming together and the idea of, you know, the hand as a five digit uh, figure and the star. Uh, and this is on the right, a star um, from the CIA when um, an unknown um, citizen um, gives their life in service of the country a small uh, star is excavated out of a marble wall. And so that became a kind of um, idea that there would be a five pointed figure as the memorial and we would erode out of it a kind of um, absence. Um, uh, it could be also referred to by some as a boulder, but that it would leave this void um, that would create a kind of passageway uh, and a shelter space and a gateway uh, to and through the campus at the location where Sean was shot uh, and killed. And the geometry um, for this five-pointed figure comes from kind of 
specific viewing angles from where he was shot to the entry to the buildings uh, adjacent. Um, and uh, this is a, a view from above. And um, for me, what was important about the memorial was that it was both metaphoric, but more importantly, quite literal about strength and this notion of every, every bit of the memorial uh, gaining its strength from supporting, supporting each other. So the, the, the memorial is made out of um, 33 blocks um that are fully incompressive and working like in a uh, five-way arch uh, that supports each other it's built off of research that was done by um, uh, students actually doctoral students philippe block matt de young and um, professor john oxendorf and they formed the company prior to the memorial uh, called ODD. And um, when I was developing the initial concepts, I called John and I asked, is this possible? Can we create this fully compressive structure where every block literally supports another block? And, um, you know, I think this is where we understand our academic institutions to be these incredible you know, research laboratories that are prototyping the future. And John said, yes, it's possible. Uh, and so we worked with a team of engineers um, uh, and uh, the um, Mason, um, masonry expert early on to um, create this five-way arch structure out of solid, solid blocks of granite. Um, and one of the things we learned is that despite all the incredible digital tools and technologies we have, we were actually working with a very ancient uh, form of technology, the arch, um, but our software tools prioritize and privilege, let's say steel versus a steel and tension versus like stone and compression. And one of the concerns was uh, that the engineers flagged is um, the structural challenges um, of a compressive system with such a low flat arch. Should there be any kind of movement or imprecision that anything, uh, any movement in the lateral direction would have a, like a six time uh, magnitude effect in the horizontal. And so it introduced the need for extremely high precision. Uh, and I thought at the time, well, we have digital tools and we have technology. We should be able to um, get to, you know, millimeter scale precision. Um, but what we learned was that, you know, materials have resistance uh, to other materials, of course. So even though we were using precision, blades and tools and diamond cut diamond blades the the blades were eroding of course the material the stone by carving it and it, at the same time the, the blade itself was being eroded so it introduced a, a level of imprecision um, as the materials wore on each other and as I showed with that structural diagram, any imprecision over two millimeters was pretty significant in, in terms of the uh, structure. And so we developed these tools to measure. And then after every block was cut, we measured it and every change to it, we modeled in the next, um, we modeled the next block in Rhino to absorb, um, absorb that difference. And so block by block, um, we carved uh, each block, they arrived on site, and we decided to build the project in a way because it was a test. Our multiple engineers were um, deliberating and um, had a different uh, perspective and expertise and a viewpoint on the ability for this structure to be a fully compressive structure with no steel or post-tensioning, uh, et cetera. So 
the blocks were brought, they were built on a, on a scaffold, they were built um, from the center out with the keystone raised uh, a couple of millimeters up uh, so that when it's lowered, the forces could begin to move uh, from the center into, its, uh, into the legs. And if you look really closely under the scaffold, you'll see some black plates and those are uh, scales. Um, and here you can see where we introduced um, some stainless steel pins and identified the areas of concern in terms of as the load uh, moved uh, into the legs, uh, where we were mindful uh, if there would be any displacement, that would be a problem for the memorial. So strain gauges were installed by, um, by the students as well as um, the masons. And then uh, I mentioned the scales that the scaffold was sitting on and the scales were measuring the weight. And so when the um, scaffold was incrementally lowered, like millimeter by millimeter, and the force of the keystone was moving into the legs, we were able to record and uh, feel reassured that indeed the structure was behaving as was designed and anticipated. And uh, there you can see some, someone under the memorial. It really does function as a kind of gateway. Um, it has these, because of the geometry, it, it um, frames uh, other spaces um, and uh, has become a place where not only those who knew Sean um, and wanted to honor Sean, but others who uh, lost loved ones during the marathon bombing can come and students can reflect um, in that space as well. So this is, was for me a, a, a kind of a transformational uh, experience. Um, I think I have for so long as an architecture student thought the term metaphor was a really um, challenging way to operate. Um, but uh, this project I think introduced um, both kind of material and meaning uh, in a way that uh, was uh, really impactful um, for, for me as a growing architect and designer. Um, I'm going to shift totally uh, to a different place in the world and uh, talk a little bit about the challenges of globalization um, and architecture. So I think we, um, there's a phrase in politics, like all politics are local. And I think all construction is local and we um, should embrace that. Um, so one of our first projects, uh, building projects was on the other side of the world for us. It was in Chengdu, China. Um, the client, um, this is after the uh, Sichuan earthquakes, the client really wanted to do new projects in this landscape, and these are exhibition halls, um, but do them in a way in which he continued to use the term Chineseness, like ha have it reflect something about the kind of historic culture. And um, what was incredibly educational for us was he sent us to the Suzhou gardens and had us study and experience the gardens. Um, he had us visit the Erme mountains and uh, get up before dawn and hike up this mountain to experience the mist, which he said was a part of the quality he also wanted to capture. And he had a, a few rules, like he asked us to make sure the courtyard house typology was present in the way that we were thinking. He didn't want any flat roofs uh, in the project. Uh, and he gave us a poem um, 
uh, that the building uh, needed to be inspired by. It was a very unusual experience, totally different way of practicing architecture and processes. Um, but, and, and in the end, we did a full set of drawings, uh, very excited uh, to use this kind of courtyard logic and packing logic to kind of break up scale. Um, and uh, we were very excited as, as young architects to have been asked to work on this project. And um, many, many, many months went by. We didn't hear anything. Uh, and then we learned that indeed the building was under construction. Um, and what was interesting was they had changed the site. They, because they changed the site, they asked us to mirror our building. Um, but ultimately, in our third or fourth version of the design, I think the kind of essence of the project and the essence of the materiality uh, was still present. And the project's built out of local brick. And what you see is the darker gray at the top is just because over time, um, the brick, the local brick manufacturer, um, the bricks got darker over time. And so that's the kind of coloration change that you're seeing um, in the building and then the large core 10 window surrounds that mediate the scale between like relatively small operable windows and the uh, mass of the building and surface of the building. Um, so I think for us, the important thing about the project was to work with local materials, local masons, um, we wanted to work with the Chinese brick, which is a very unique color scale shape. Um, but we were, we were trying to figure out how to um, give the building a tectonic quality that could be easily uh, understood. So we said, well, what if the brick had an orientation? Uh, so every brick faces the cardinal north, south, or east, west. Uh, and thus, on the angled sides of the building, because the bricks are true north, south, east, west, you get this kind of texture and feathering effect that gives the brick a kind of scale and texture and quality. And I think the biggest compliment from the client when the project was over was that it had achieved that kind of quality or that essence that he was looking for of the kind of old uh, in the new. Um, not so far from um, Chengdu, China, this is a project in Shenzhen that we recently completed. Um, and uh, the project is um, a small kind of amenity structure in a larger complex, housing complex. Um, and what we were very keen to do was to figure out how to make this space and place um, tolerable from a climate um, perspective, from a heat perspective. So in Shenzhen, um, it's, it's very, very hot and humid. Uh, and um, the location of our um, kind of pavilion amenity structure building was such that um, the buildings were not around it were not going to provide the self shade to cool the area. Uh, and so we took some cues and lessons from um, other architects. Um, so this is the Renzo Piano's Manil, where you can see how the daylight enters the space. Uh, and the kind of diffuse light quality so light without heat. Uh, that's introduced and uh, even you know, um, really powerful. Another powerful example uh, by Hisak um, is the Hydrographic Studies Center here. They're made out of concrete, but we uh, really wanted to look at how we introduce light and reduce heat in order to create shade. And we did a series of studies on what kind of geometry these louvers need to have in order to create a kind of self-shade for the structure and the public space uh, below. 
um, and after a series of tests, you know, settled on um, a specific geometry that's the lower right hand corner, uh, which uh, significantly reduced the heat from the sun, but allowed for a lot of diffuse light. Um, these were kind of custom extrusions. Um, you can see our kind of sample cut that were then um, installed and um, bring a lot of shade and even if uh, we're able to reduce the temperature by one or two degrees um, underneath and then before the heat hits the um, enclosed structure, I think that is a significant um, benefit that you literally feel quite, quite quickly as you experience the space. Um, I talked a little bit about cities and the city that um, we practice in is Boston, which is a kind of old historic city and uh, it has many challenges of historic cities, uh, but it also has some incredible qualities as well. Um, the project is along what we call the high spine um, in Boston, which has a series of taller buildings. But right adjacent to it is a village, which is a, um, a, has an urban fabric of very small scale, like four story buildings. So it's an interesting area of the city where the, the kind of these two scales um, intersect quite abruptly. And, um, you know, mayor, um, the mayor of Boston, uh, Marty Walsh was uh, very active in trying to increase uh, housing in Boston, um, all kinds of housing, and he's the one that implemented um, the requirement that all, all the buildings have 17% uh, affordable housing, 13 or 17%, can't, can't remember, but um, so there was a real push to increase the amount of housing in the center of the city um, and a very active um, uh, approvals process in the city because as uh, that housing demand was increasing, there was a lot of housing being built and a, a variety of kind of quality and the neighbors um, in Bay Village were very concerned, you know, they did not want an all glass kind of high rise uh, building to abut their uh, neighborhood. And so working with the community, the developer in the city, we uh, looked for the kind of uh, material qualities uh, of the area and vicinity and try to think of this building um, in a way that could kind of capture that, that rich materiality, but in a contemporary uh, context. And so these were early mock-ups um, out of foam. And the goal was to get away from like the flatness of um, these super, super tall buildings going up and introduce a kind of material quality, depth, richness um, uh, to that. And so you can see the project in context, the project from the Bay Village neighborhood side. The footprint is absolutely um, it's tiny. It's, it's super, super tight. You can really see that on the ground floor. And what was really important in our dialogue with the neighborhood is uh, there could really be no back, back to the um, uh, building because as a multifamily residential, it works on both sides, both the high spine of Stewart Street, but also the kind of neighborhood scale of Bay Village. So what was what was in the previous version, the kind of back loading dock of the uh, of the building eventually became through the process, which I think these processes always make buildings better. Um, we introduced two townhouses uh, so that uh, there could be fronts on both sides of uh, Shaman Street. Um, and so that project's currently under construction. Um, and you can see 
the use of the precast panels. And one of the things we always try to do is um, have a economy to the way we introduce quality in a project. Uh, so initially we thought um, reducing the number of unique profiles would help limit the cost uh, to do these uh, panels. But we actually learned it wasn't the molds, the unique molds that would be cost prohibited. It was actually the time on site uh, for a crane to literally pick up each panel and lift it into place. So ultimately, uh, uh, we learned that for this kind of local construction with a precast facility, um, you know, in a 20 minute proximity, the more economical way to do this was actually to have more molds, um, but less, less um, picks uh, to pick up each panel, less time to pick up each panel by crane uh, and install them. So that is um, happening as we speak. So the last project I wanted to share was um, the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers. So the memorial really endeavors to tell uh, the story of the approximate 4,000 men, women, and children who built, worked, sustained uh, life at the University of Virginia from its founding in 1817 to the end of the Civil War. Um, and many of their names and identities remain unknown today. And this was our first kind of material gesture we made, which was to carve in the word unknown into um, this piece of stone. Uh, it, it's a project that's the work of many. Um, and it's like, you know, it took a village and over 10 years and we as architects and designers arrived at the kind of towards the end of uh, really um, important process that the university went through with its community. Um, and uh, we were able to help uh, bring that whole process to life. Um, and we had an incredible team. Our team of collaborators includes Mabel Wilson, of uh, Studio and, um, and she's both a designer and a cultural historian. Um, Frank Dukes, who, uh, who's expertise is in engagement and negotiation. And uh, he had worked for a long time um, uh, on courses he taught at UVA on race and repair and started the UCARE organization. Greg Gleam, our landscape architect, and Eto Otitike, who was uh, our incredible artist on the team. And Mabel once shared that, you know, to tell the story of, United, of the United States requires a reckoning with hard truths, um, with those histories that have been silenced in the nation's archives and in the public spaces of our shared landscape. And you really see that um, it's absolutely evident when you look at this historical marker at UVA, which tells the story of its founding with no mention of slavery. Um, the University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson. He's the signer of the Declaration of Independence, third president of the United States. So he holds a very special place in US history. Um, but he, uh, and he's associated with the ideals of democracy, um, yet it, both the university and his own um, Monticello was really built on the foundations of slavery. He owned uh, 600 enslaved people uh, during his lifetime. And uh, in this historic print from 1830, we see the lawn and the academical village. And if you look really closely on the left, um, you see one of the oldest representations of slavery in the United States, or sorry, in the university. Um, and it's a history that was hidden in plain sight for 155 years at UVA. Uh, and this hidden history is embedded in the university landscape, um, in the architecture, 
And while we think of Jefferson as the architect of UVA, it was the enslaved workers, uh, many young boys who broke their backs uh, doing the labor. And you can see you know, imprints of their fingers, fingerprints on the bricks. Uh, and this one here is from actually Monticello. So the first recognition of history, of this history, uh, was formed uh, was in the form of an expression of regret uh, that the UVA Board of Visitors uh, issued in 2007. And it was a plaque, it was installed near the rotunda, um, and it had the unintended consequence of sparking outrage among the students at the University of Virginia. The students were really dismayed uh, by the limits of this recognition, um, especially the wording, uh, helped to realize Thomas Jefferson's design, uh, you know, in the language of the act itself. So that same year, our collaborator Frank Dukes uh, began UCARE, um, Community Action for Racial Equity, and one of the students, um, student interns uh, in that organization created an advocacy group called the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers. And she did that in 2009. And that's where the name for the memorial comes from. Uh, it was named by the, the students. And then in 2012, um, that the hidden history became even more tangible to the university and the community when archeologists discovered 70 unmarked graves behind the university's official cemetery. And that same year, the UVA president commissioned the President's Commission on Slavery at the university to study, um, to study uh, how one could reveal this new um, history and uh, consider a memorial. So when we were commissioned to design this memorial, almost a decade had already gone into the development of, um, of the research around the history. Um, and um, you know, what, what we were told was that the memorial had to both honor the lives of the enslaved, but it also had to advance the commemorative landscape of racial justice today. And what we heard that the memorial needed to be from students, faculty, local community, and also descendants of the enslaved um, was that it had to express dualities. It had to not only express pain and suffering, but also resilience and dignity um, and, and the true humanity of those who were enslaved and their strengths and their struggles. Um, we were not given a site per se, we were given multiple possible sites. We didn't have a budget, we didn't have a scale. Um, our client group was everyone um, in a way. And so to foreground the kind of openness, um, we decided to have a process where we brought all our early concepts to the community uh, at various uh, scales um, early on to get input. Um, and what we heard was, um, in terms of a reaction to some of our early sketches, was that the memorial had to be a space in and of itself. It had to be a space for the community of the present to, to learn from, from essentially the past. So a kind of coming together of people. Uh, and, and that's what determined the kind of form, that it would be a space It's inspired by the ring shout, as well as the kind of clearing in the woods, like a hush harbor. Um, and the ring shout is this low country dance uh, that comes from West African practices. And so that uh, created a very simple, on one hand, idea in terms of a place to gather. And, um, and then it was really important that it's tied to the larger commemorative landscape in Charlottesville and the University of Virginia, where there had been already much effort to identify specific structures um, that reflect uh, the history of uh, enslavement at the university. 
And so this is a community gathering on Freedom Day, which is a march that happens from the historic auction block to the university. Um, and I think you can see how um, it's positioned in proximity to the rotunda, but in a way it's the rotunda's opposite. So where the rotunda is a sphere and a dome and it's closed, um, the memorial is uh, conical in its form and it's open uh, and it's open to reveal and uh, invite. And so the geometry is nestled into the landscape. It's created by two intersecting cones, which results in this kind of crescent figure. Um, and it's again, a symbol of many things and intentionally holds uh, multiple uh, meanings. And um, there are layers to the kind of material meaning of uh, each of the uh, layers to the memorial. Um, it's uh, kind of scale is determined by the human body. Uh, we wanted, this is a mock-up in our studio. We wanted to make sure it never felt uh, oppressive or dangerous uh, and that you could be on one side and be able to easily kind of look over. We mocked it up in stone um, at Quora who fabricated and installed the memorial. It's made out of Virginia mist, which is quarried locally um, nearby. Uh, and then we introduce this kind of horizon line that sweeps around the memorial and kind of expresses those dualities from a texture on the exterior to a very different quality on the interior. And so one of the biggest challenges was around the names. There are, I, as I said, 4,000 estimated enslaved persons, but um, uh, many of those uh, individuals are actually unknown in terms of their names. So we have only about 577 partial or full names, uh, and the, the rest of the enslaved, we only have um, other kinds of records of. Um, and so uh, the team decided that um, the best way to present the kind of 4,000 approximate enslaved was to imagine it as this kind of genealogical cloud that stretches across in chronological order. Uh, and so when you walk up to the memorial, there is a mark for every enslaved person. It's in the form of a, a carving in or an incision or a We call them memory marks. Um, every uh, person, and then we do know a name. It's inscribed above, um, where we know uh, a skill or a task that is also, or trade that is also carved above. And when we know kinship or can assume kinship, that's also inscribed above. And because the marks are made as water collects in that uh, gash and then releases um, a little bit later than the surface around uh, dries and you get this kind of streaking, drying, bleeding quality to the memorial. Um, and then there's a timeline that's carved into the bench um, and there are about 70 entries in that timeline. And they're quite succinct and, and succinct entries. And I think the succinctness gives a sense of the kind of power um, and horror of um, the, the lives. And I'll just read this one quote um, by Isabella Gibbons, who is present uh, in many ways in this memorial. Uh, she was an enslaved woman who was freed and stayed in the community after she was freed and spent her life as a teacher. And she said, can we forget the crack of the whip, the cowhide, the whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, 
the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness. Have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? Uh, no, we have not uh, or ever will. And um, Isabella, I think we, she became the, the kind of watcher and the witness for this memorial. And uh, Eto Otuchigbe, who did this incredible work um, called um, uh, Becoming Visible, was brought on the team to um, develop a work around Isabella Gibbons. And there's a, a, a carving of her eyes at a kind of colossal scale. This was an early test um, uh, to inscribe her literal figure. Um, there are very few enslaved persons for whom we have a photograph from this period at the University of Virginia and to make that legible in this kind of um, uh, highly textured uh, way. So I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to conclude by um, sharing um, how the memorial um, opened uh, last year, um, but it was still a construction site. And uh, when uh, George Floyd was killed, there was, a, I, guess, I think we all experienced a kind of huge national horror and grief. And the Memorial to Enslave uh, Labor Site at EVA became a site where individuals and small groups and then those groups got larger and larger, uh, came to acknowledge um, the kind of brutality of uh, George Floyd's death. And the memorial became a, a site to recognize the injustices that persist in the wake of slavery uh, today. Maybe I will conclude, conclude there. Wow, Nijan, thank you so much. Uh, just thinking about uh, through the course of your lecture, I, I've reflected on uh, how I've appreciated your work over the years since I've since I've um, you know since your first projects, and uh, came to know you early on as being uh, so skilled with design and material craft and technology, and you know the thoughtful approach to bringing ideas into the world uh, from a kind of technology and design perspective and just want to acknowledge the significance of your work uh, wrestling with such such fundamental issues you know issues of such fundamental importance to all of us and all of our campuses and all of our uh, built you know throughout the built environment uh, so I, I but i'll just pass the baton to the students now uh, who, who will lead the discussion have lots of questions for you and Greer has uh, generously offered to moderate their questions. Wonderful, thank you again for your lecture. Um, Jasir, do you wanna go ahead and get us started? Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Jasir Mills. I'm a third year architecture student at UNC Charlotte. And my question to you was regarding the memorial to enslaved laborers, if we're using that as a precedent, how can designers, especially um, young uh, academic designers begin to think about ways to rehabilitate these original built environments that were constructed from racist ideologies. Mm. It's such an exceptional question, Sasser. And I think um, so many people are thinking about that question now. I think the memorial to enslaved laborers, like what, what I thought was extraordinary about the project and you know I wish I actually hadn't stopped where I stopped but I noticed I was over time that what was really important and what was shared by the descendant community of the enslaved was how it had to be a living memorial and uh, in that way it's it's also a living archive and so um, 
During the construction of the memorial, a few additional names were discovered by historians and researchers. And then um, several weeks ago, um, the Hearns, so five, um, five new names were brought forward by the descendants of the enslaved. And that was verified both through research, but also DNA. Um, and I think their names were hand inscribed on the memorial wall. And I think for me, that was a really important contribution that the historians on the team made. Um, and I thought that the community came together in an unusual way. Um, and, you know, one of, and I think it's because like, it was students who pushed the beginning of this project. It was then faculty who joined, they brought scholarship and knowledge. Um, and then uh, in addition, um, in addition to, to that, in the outreach process, what we learned is people were very uncomfortable coming to the University of Virginia. Some refer to it as the plantation, you know? And so we created a, a way to have ambassadors um, at, you know, students, faculty, members of UCARE that would go out to the community. And then we went out to the community. So we met in churches like Eto, Mabel, myself. We met in local churches in schools, um, things we had assumed like that, even wording that we had thought would be not good or good. We, at the conversation we learned, you know, it, we, we learned so many of our assumptions were incorrect uh, and it really required dialogue and conversation. So if there's anything to learn, I think for from the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers is you both need time for that dialogue and conversation so that you can build trust um, because that trust has been eroded for very, very, um, you know, it's clear why that trust has been eroded over time and rebuilding that trust is important to, I think, building good design. And then also lastly, to acknowledge as an architect or designer that um, you're, you're, sometimes you come in actually at the very end of a process and you have responsibilities above and beyond your own creative imagination um, when you are entrusted with the work that many have already invested in over a period of time. Thank you. Elvie? Hi, I'm Elby. I'm a, a final semester graduate student. And um, my question for you is uh, regarding you, what do you see as the biggest problem in the building industry as well as the architectural profession? Um, and as an educator yourself, how do you think that maybe architecture education can start to address these problems more effectively? Um, so I think we have many problems <laughs> as, as I outlined in the beginning. Um, I would say like among our very, very many problems, I would say is the fact that architecture and construction consumes materials uh, at massive scales and we contribute to um, greenhouse gas emissions like the building industry does uh, at a significant, significant percentage, right? And um, I think for many years, we've been focused on the performance side of sustainability, but I think now architects are shifting to thinking about the full life cycle uh, side of buildings and materials and embodied energy. And, you know, I remember myself like learning how horrible concrete is. And yet at the same time, it's the, I think it's the second most uh, used material next to water in the world, right? And that's because in terms of building, there are efficiency, there, there's a reason concrete is still used in many parts of the world. 
And I'm learning like as architects, we can do something, but I've also recently seen policies roll out in different uh, places that are also doing something. So in China, in one of our projects, I recently learned that 50% of the building has to be fabricated, prefabricated. And I think that is to reduce not only noise and pollution and dust in the area, but also to reduce uh, the automatic impulse to do everything as poured in place concrete. You know, and so it's creating innovation in the building industry. I think architects are thinking about circular construction and the circular economy and adaptive reuse in another way. So I would say that on the sustainability side. And then on the profession side, I think one of our biggest challenges is owning our expertise. You know, I think uh, as architects, we're generalists. To, to a big extent and we bring together experts and we choreograph and then we synthesize. And I think that is incredible expertise and skill and ability. So we, we um, should continue to do that. Um, but I've seen like big tech and other, um, you know, big tech, you know, with, uh, with, um, uh, Toronto and Google, like there's an initiative by many others to take on uh, building as their expertise. I, and I actually think it's well motivated. It's motivated by thinking, oh, why does construction take so long? You know, the three-legged stool between the architect, client, and contractor, that just that slows it down. The policies, the processes, the approvals processes, it makes it very long, very expensive. And so other people are saying, well, you know, I'm a smart businessman. Maybe I can do this, do this better. I think we need to own our expertise. Like our expertise is not purely efficiency, but it's like the whole synthetic thinking of what um, making and creating and building in the world um, means, you know, and also, uh, like what it means and the means to do it, right? The processes, the techniques, et cetera. Wonderful. Mazume, you wanna go next? Sure. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm Mazume and I'm a MR2 student. Actually, uh, when I was uh, reading the article, um, the gutters are for rain, I was thinking <laughs> about uh, how uh, diversity and equity are improved now compared to the past, but uh, there are still inequalities regarding race, gender, or na uh, nationality. So my question is, um, did any specific experiences when, um, where, uh, when you were a student and when you were entering the profession mm -hmm. um, shape your, like, leadership at Cornell and if hmm. so how was that I knew you guys will ask all the hard questions <laughs> so um you know it's interesting my perspective has changed recently um uh, not super recently but incrementally over let's say the past decade I think initially I um I I wanted to be known as an architect first. And then maybe, you know, you can figure out what my gender is and blah, blah, blah. you know, but I, I, you know, would be offended if someone called me a woman architect, an Asian woman architect, an Asian architect. Um, I really just wanted to be an architect um, and respected as such. And, um, but I think actually, now, I think I am very proud to say I'm a woman architect or an Asian architect. I think owning one's identity is something that I think is reflective of a more collective shared understanding around um, race and the importance to strive for equity that might have been less daylit and discussed 
and um, uh, people were comfortable acknowledging, let's say before. And so uh, I think this moment is really important for everyone. Like we, we are a multicultural democracy. It is uh, being tested. It is an experiment and uh, we need to uh, demonstrate that it can succeed. And to do that, everybody needs to, to uh, put, put energy and effort into it and challenge all our previous assumptions. You know, I'm, I'm surprised every day by what I'm learning. Um, and I think that's a good thing that we are now learning or unlearning and then relearning um, both our you know, histories, our own individual histories, our country's history, a global history. Uh, and I think that's gonna be significant for our discipline. Nathan? Hello, um, I am Nathan, uh, second year undergrad. Um, so uh, in an interview last January, when asked how architects should respond to labor issues in the construction industry, uh, you said that architects have an ability to impact labor by advocating for how important sound ethical labor practices are. And that architects everywhere ought to be consistent in applying our mandate to decisions we make and influence. So my question is, uh, in your view, what are the reasonable extents of an architect's adv advocacy? Well, I, you know, I recently had a conversation with a colleague where, you know, we were talking about which projects we walk away from. So I think that's one form of advocacy, which is saying no. So this colleague of mine doesn't do projects in certain areas of the world. Um, and then I think um, other ways to engage as an architect with agency around labor is actually how you design. Uh, I recently saw a very beautiful project uh, by Tatiana Bilbauer, like acknowledging that the laborer um, is uh, a craftsperson and designing the building so that it requires that kind of hand craft in it in order to be built and by local community uh, labor and craftspeople, right? So that's not often though, I have to say, like, you know, in a, in a creative field that is also driven by market and economic, economic realities, um, driving towards like the lowest, you know, cost is usually informing how decisions are made. And, you know, sometimes I also ask the question, is it better to engage and know that you're making this much improvement or is it better to not engage at all? And I think that's a decision every architect has to make within the kind of context that they're operating, operating in. And I think the answer is gonna be different for everyone, but I, I do think, um, you know, the other thing that, um, like the, the assumption of what the solution will be is no longer the assumption, you know, like if we assume that technology is going to be the answer, we've learned technology is not the answer, right? It's like our own ability to build in our value systems to how we design, but then impact how it's built or our own value systems and how we build a practice. And I actually think the, um, the generation younger than me is doing a really incredible job and your generation too in making clear the kind of values of their, of their practice. And so just like the Memorial for Enslaved Laborers, I think sometimes you, you just look at your students and you know where you need to go, right? In terms of um, how to shift, shift the discipline if you have the opportunity to do so. And I think we get to do that through teaching, 
we get to do that through a scholarship and we get to do that through practice. And I think all of them contribute in different ways. Like I think right now, the amount of research and scholarship going into sustainability, um, circular construction, um, it's going to really be transformational compared to at least the education I received when I was an architect. Thank you, Noor. Hi, I'm Noor, um, I'm a third year undergrad. Uh, my question is, um, what are your expectations whenever you work on civic projects? And do you go in person mm -hmm. and see the site to see the impact on people or you just, you know, yeah. leave it? <laughs> So my expectation with any public project is it's going to be very, very, very hard. Um, and uh, uh, especially anything that deals with trauma or history or um, conflict, I, I know it will take a kind of emotional, emotional toll um, and require making space and time to, to do it. So yeah, that's one thing I know about public projects. And I always see the site. I, I can you know, never design without understanding context. And I think what's happening now is now we understand context is more than just the physical site, but it's like the labor context, the historic context, the material supply chain context. And um, I think that, yeah, so now we have to, you know, when we start a project and when you guys start a project, there's so many more variables like that you have to have to take on. And um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's incredible that you guys have that from the beginning. You know that from the beginning. I think it's something that I learned over my, my career. Wonderful, Samuel. Yeah, so um, kind of like at the end of your presentation, you kind of talked about um, the, I guess the free lady that was, you kind of like, <clears throat> I guess singled out and kind of projected all over your project um, with, the kind of Is design. Isabella Gibbons? Yes, ma'am. Um, as kind of like departing from that in the article you kind of wrote about um, Daughters of Hurain, not women. Um, my question is, how do you further plan to integrate and uplift the significance and importance of feminism in architecture, in project designs, and or in practice or the office? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So I'm super impressed that all of you have uh, done research uh, and, um, you know, maybe I could share that the reason Isabella became a protagonist for the project um, was not just because we had a photograph of her, um, because we had a quote from her, but I think because of what she represents, like, uh, a woman who was a teacher, who, you know, um, cared for others, devoted her, her life to teaching, right? And uh, maybe more than gender, um, like, I think the teachers are kind of heroes, right? Our, our educators investing a kind of lifetime in, um, like educating because they also have to learn constantly in order to in order to teach. So in the question of feminism, I, I can only say that um, when I became a mother, uh, I understood that um, nothing I had done to date was hard. <laughs> that was all relatively easy um, to becoming a mom and um, I have enormous respect for, I had, I, be, I had enormous respect for my mother always, but even more after I became a mother. And I think before we would never talk about our children ever. If you're a woman, faculty meeting, you don't talk about your children. But I think that's changed. And I think, you know, um, 
And I think we see in our discipline how much the kind of female to male student body shift has happened, female to male faculty has also shifted all within, you know, I think a pretty tight span of like 10, 15 years. And, you know, my dream is that we would see that shift happen in academia and in the profession that matches the population in the US. Uh, and I think that can happen because we, we saw it happen across gender lines, you know, in the last, in the last decade or so, so. Great, I think uh, Greer's telling me that we're, we're at time. Yeah. <laughs> I want to respect everyone's time, uh, but this conversation could obviously continue and it's, it's, it's such a meaningful conversation. Mija, and I just want to thank you so much for sharing with us today uh, and the students for sharing your thoughtful questions. And Mija, uh, I, I, just some parting thoughts. I think, uh, you know, thinking about those first slides that you showed and all the uncertainty and turmoil in the world and all the, you know, the pace of change and the kind of placelessness that we feel uh, in this Zoom world uh, of the pandemic, uh, I really appreciate the degree to which your leadership and your architecture bring a kind of reassurance and a much needed stability a much needing needed honoring of the people that need honoring and the places that need honoring uh, so you you do us the best service as uh, representing our field and just want to really uh, appreciate the example that you set for all of us thank you that's very generous thank you all